Okay, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Michael Butler, an investment director within our alternatives business in Europe, which means that I spend a lot of my time working with institutional investors to help them build and maintain a private markets portfolio. Now, during the coffee break, one of my colleagues said to me, I'm glad your session is on shortly after the coffee break because private markets, it's very technical and people will need their coffee. I'm thinking, wow, what a way to build someone's confidence up before they stand up in front of 350 people. But I think his point was well made and that sometimes private markets can be a little bit intangible for people. So what I'm going to try to do today is I'm going to use a range of different examples of companies that investors are allocating to within private markets to hit on some of the themes that Niall spoke about in his session earlier on. Now, as a brief, brief reminder of those themes, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about changing of the guard and the type of private market companies you can invest in that will help you bring hedging against inflation within your portfolio. Then I'm going to talk about position for transition and I'm going to show a range of different private market companies that can help you meet a range of environmental and social impact goals. Before finally talking about modern diversification, and I'm going to illustrate a range of different companies who are innovative or leaders in their sectors that are helping investors to enhance diversification within their overall portfolio. So let's talk, talk initially about inflation in private markets. So we all know we're in a rising inflation environment. And in a rising inflation environment, we get higher prices, followed by higher wages, ultimately leading to higher interest rates. So the key question for investors in private markets is, does the demand for private market companies change uh, as prices increase? And how will the valuation of those companies be impacted by rising interest rates? So to answer that question, I'm going to walk through a range of the different private market asset classes uh, starting initially with the infrastructure. So within infrastructure equity, here we're thinking about companies that are regarded as core infrastructure companies. Companies that have maybe long-term contracts with governments or, or with counterparties with high credit ratings. And those contracts are typically linked to inflation. So you think about companies that provide uh, regulated utility services. So think about your, your gas and electricity bills. Have you seen increases in the price of those bills recently? I'm sure you have. Think about anything to do with um, toll roads, if my clicker would work. Um, toll roads and uh, any imp increases in the price of using your toll roads recently. Or telephone masts and any anticipated increase in the cost of using mobile phones. And these examples, they all share a common characteristic. And that common characteristic is they are providing essential services to the functioning of society. In other words, we use them every day. So as prices increase, demand for these type of products and solutions doesn't change. And therefore, they can provide a good inflation hedge. And underlying this, the infrastructure equity managers, they're actually hedging the interest rate exposure, at least in the short to medium term. So as interest rates increase, um, the, these, uh, these firms are protected against uh, rising inflation. Within real estate, um, now real estate shares many similar characteristics to, to infrastructure equity. And um, really what you're trying to find here is you're trying to find, if you can find properties whose rents increase in line with inflation, or maybe where there's clauses within the rental agreement that allow you to pass on higher inflation to the end tenant, you're going to get in a good inflation hedge. So an example of that will be in the industrial sector. Um, if you think of um, logistics, uh, so anything to do with data warehouses, storage units, um, anything that is highly in demand, much easier to pass on at higher prices. Same can be said about uh, residential property, particularly residential property in prime locations, much easier to pass on rent increases. In contrast, the, the retail properties and office buildings still reeling from the impact of the pandemic, trying to find their, their way in terms of how we shop after the pandemic and how we, we go to work after the pandemic, so a more selective approach needed here. It also varies by country. Um, in Europe, it's much more normal to pass on inflation increases on a year-by-year -year basis, whereas in the US and UK, inflation increases tend to happen every three to five years, so a bit more of a lagged impact there. So a selective approach needed. Within private equity, then, it's very much manager-specific. Is the manager running people-like businesses so that when wages increase, the profitability of the companies they manage isn't that impacted? 
in terms of can they pass on higher energy costs to their end consumer? And are they able to control the level of debt within the capital structure in anticipation of rising interest rates? And actually, we've seen a lot of private equity managers look to bring down the level of debt within the companies that they manage more recently. And really what you're looking for here is you're looking for uh, managers who have been here before. They've seen an inflation cycle. But of course, it's been a while since we've seen an inflation cycle. So it means you're looking for the older, the more established managers. And sometimes those older, more established managers, they're, they're high in demand, they're hard to get access to, they're capacity constrained, getting access is key. Now, in the session earlier on, Niall's session, he did a survey in terms of which asset classes would provide the best protection against inflation. And I was very interested to see that private debt um, was the lowest down in terms of the response. Um, because I think private debt has a very important role to play in a higher inflation environment. And the reason behind that is because private debt loans are floating rate. So when interest rates, when inflation increases, interest rates also increase typically. And if interest rates are increasing, it means the income that the private debt managers are getting from the companies that they're lending to will increase. So actually, rising interest rates is a good thing for private debt. Now, that's definitely the case up to a point. I mean, if interest rates were to rise too fast, too quickly, and close a global recession, it'll surely impact the ability of um, companies to be able to repay back their loans. Although, that being said, a number of private debt managers, all private debt managers, uh, have structural protections in place to be, able to, um, to be able to take control when they need to a little bit quicker. But in any case, a more stagflationary environment isn't our base case scenario at the moment. So we still think that private debt will do well in the current inflation environment. Then the second theme I'm going to explore is position for transition and looking at how private markets can help investors meet various different environmental and social impact goals. Now, if I went back five years ago, there was not a huge range of strategies um, in private markets that are focusing on impact and sustainability for investors to choose from. And to be honest, the results were a little bit mixed. But if you fast forward to today, the range of strategies that are available for investors to, uh, to invest in has massively increased. To the point now that investors uh, can identify a range of environmental and social themes, like Hill spoke about earlier on, that they want in their portfolio. They can use the UN Sustainable Development Goals as a guide or a framework to be able to identify managers that have specific strategies to meet the themes that they want to target. And then thankfully, managers reporting has come on a significant way over the last number of years. So as investors can now see the real world impact of the environmental and social impact goals that they're targeting. So let's take a look at some examples of companies I'm talking about. Now, within infrastructure, there'll be the typical examples of you build a new wind farm, you build a new solar farm, and that adds clean electricity to the grid, a clear environmental positive. But there are a range of other social impact strategies that infrastructure managers can pursue. We've seen infrastructure managers work with governments in sub-Saharan Africa and South Asia to be able to um, build and maintain boreholes for the provision of clean water to the local population. We've seen the use of solar-powered cookers to be able to reduce the need to burn fossil fuels. And we've seen biogas plant digesters used in rural farmlands, where farmers can take the farm waste, put it into the, the gas digester, burn it in a clean and efficient way, producing energy as a result, capturing the, the methane gas byproduct, and producing a fertilizer that the farmers can use in their land, clearly hitting on a number of sustainable development goals for investors. Within private equity, this is the third time in a row you're going to have heard about the circular economy, um, but private equity sponsored firms getting involved in anything to do with reduce, reuse, recycle. The example here being um, subscription bicycle and e uh, scooter services. There's also, there's also anything to do with uh, food technology and revolutionizing or improving the food and technology by um, producing more healthier and sustainable foods, sustainably packaged foods, ultimately trying to reduce the amount of food waste that's produced. And Nick stole my picture in his previous presentation, but um, it's the whole idea of private equity sponsored firms providing those sensors and that artificial intelligence and those aerial drones for farmers to be able to monitor the temperature and moisture level within the land to be able to figure out 
where specifically in the, in the land they need to deploy water and fertilizer, uh, reducing the overuse of water and fertilizer and improving crop yield. Again, hitting on a number of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. This ticker is just taking a little bit to go on. Um, within real estate, um, unfortunately, this is what happens when you put into Google an image of a green building, um, overemphasize it, I think, a little bit. But the whole idea is that you're looking for more renewable sources of power within buildings or the provision of social housing or affordable housing. Again, hitting on a number of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Private debt has come a long way in the last 12 months even in, in relation to implementing with intent. We're now seeing, particularly across Europe, a lot of the private debt managers, when they lend to companies, they will say to the company, the interest rate that we will give you will reduce if you hit a number of ESG metrics within your company. And these ESG metrics can be things like uh, improving diversity and inclusion within the workforce, or um, having a better work, workforce safety record, or monitoring your, your, carbon your, your carbon footprint and putting in place a plan to reduce that over time. We're also seeing private debt managers launch new impact strategies, for example, financing the transition to clean energy. The final theme then that I will focus on today is diversification through innovation. And the idea here is that themes and opportunities, they change from year to year. But innovative companies with distinctive assets will always be rewarded, no matter what the economic backdrop. And we're finding that these innovative companies, they want to stay private for longer. And now they can stay private because they can access private equity and private debt financing to enable them to do so. And by staying private, they're able to focus on what they're good at, and that's designing new and innovative solutions, um, and that's uh, rather than having to worry about next quarter's earnings results. And that's one of the reasons why we see a return premium, typically from investing in private markets over public market equivalents. And we can see this coming through in the numbers. The number of public companies in the US has declined by about 20% over the last 10 years, whereas the number of private equity-sponsored firms has more than doubled. Let's look again at some examples of the type of companies um, that are providing that innovation, if I focus initially on private equity. There's lots of examples I could give here, but I'm going to focus on some of the healthcare and technology companies. We've seen private equity-sponsored biotech firms in the area of gene sequencing, so developing vaccines against COVID, for example, much, much quicker, or using precision medicine to be able to identify using your genes which medicine works best for you but might not work for somebody else. One of the most interesting developments I've seen is in the area of medtech. We've seen implantable drug delivery systems, which is basically a tiny little microchip that's put into your body, roams around your body trying to find a part of your body that's infected, and locally delivers medicine to be able to cure that infection. That sounds like science fiction, but these are actually FDA-approved products. And we've seen within health and wellness, we've seen healthcare by Zoom, improving affordability of healthcare um, and access to everybody. Within finance, um, we've seen areas, disruptive technologies and fintech, making our lives a little bit easier in terms of maybe how we do our banking, changing our mortgage account, on, uh, changing our bank account online, um, monitoring our mortgage, um, or even being able to get a valuation done in our house by looking at comparable property sales in a region. There's also a lot of innovation coming through in the infrastructure equity space. The typical examples we'll be familiar with in, in infrastructure equity is the, the innovation to decrease the cost of uh, producing wind and solar farms, and that's obviously come a long way. But there's also a range of other innovative solutions in terms of um, software innovation. So infrastructure equity managers can view projects in 3D, making sure that those projects are therefore delivered on time and on cost. We're also potentially seeing the era of the wooden skyscraper. So innovative techniques to be able to glue timber sheets together, to be able to create a substance that's comparable in strength with steel and um, with cement. And we've seen examples of this in, in Norway. There's the Miosa Tower. In Vienna, there's the Hoho Tower. Both of these, almost 20 stories high, made 75% from sustainable timber. And we're even seeing innovation in uh, how plastic is being recycled. We're seeing plastic bottles and uh, coffee cups being used in the construction of roads. And while I've spoken so far 
innovation at the company level, there's also an awful lot of innovation occurring at the strategy level as well, particularly in relation to the use of open-ended funds. So open-ended funds provide liquidity to investors within private markets. And we've seen the range of strategies available within, infra within private uh, infrastructure equity and real estate equity uh, increase quite significantly in the last number of years. And now we're also seeing private debt open-ended strategies starting to come to market, giving investors the, the optionality of liquidity within private debt for the first time. We're seeing different techniques to be able to reduce the J-curve in private markets. So the J-curve is the idea that it takes a number of years before your investments start generating returns in private markets. But there's different solutions like continuation funds to help manage that. And a continuation fund in a private equity space is that a private equity manager might have 15 companies within their portfolio. And when they reach the end of the fund life, they have to sell those 15 companies to return money back to investors. But there might be five companies that they really like. Uh, they're star performers. They know these companies are going to continue to grow. They don't want to sell them to another private equity manager. So they take these five companies, they put them into a separate continuation fund, and then investors can invest in that continuation fund, get immediate deployment of capital, start generating returns straight away, mitigate that J-curve. So, in summary, uh, private market investors have been allocating to private markets over the last decade to improve returns and improve diversification. But we're also finding that as investors continue to allocate to private markets, they're finding the added benefit of getting inflation protection within their portfolios. They're able to meet a number of their environmental impact and social goals. And they're also finding that they're investing in leading companies in their sectors with innovative ideas, enhancing overall portfolio diversification. To do all of this, an effective portfolio construction process is needed. So you need to identify the themes and opportunities you want to focus on, like some of the themes and opportunities we're talking about today. Identify the managers with those particular strategies and build a diversified portfolio of managers. The future is bright for private markets. It's anticipated that uh, assets under management in private equity will grow by about 15% per annum to about 10 trillion by 2025, and similar strong growth expected in infrastructure equity, private debt, and real estate. And I say it's going to be a golden decade for investing in private markets, and hopefully through some of the examples I've just shared with you, you'll get the sense why hopefully that might indeed be the case. I'm going to pause there. I still have two minutes left, so I'm going to ask Annabelle back to the stage, maybe to see if any questions have been coming up while I was speaking. Thank you, Michael. You make uh, investing into private markets sound really easy, and, and you covered a lot, so I'm sure there are some questions. Uh, for our virtual audience, uh, you can simply send a question through, uh, by pressing the Q&A button on your screen. Uh, and for everyone here, you can raise your hand, or you can do the same. You can open the hub and, and post a question. So I'll start with one question here, Michael, um, and I think it's quite topical. How is the crisis in Ukraine likely to impact private markets' investments? Okay. Um, the impact of the crisis in Ukraine so far has been relatively minor within the um, private market universe in terms of the, the managers having exposure to Ukraine and Russia has been very, very low. There will obviously be some secondary market impacts in terms of maybe higher costs of raw materials, higher costs of energy, or maybe some supply chain disruptions that you would expect to happen in the coming months. But maybe one of the areas where it'll be felt the most is within private market natural resource funds, an area that I didn't talk about in, in my session. Um, but private market natural resource funds, they've been in a secular decline for the last 10 years or so. Um, mainly because nobody wanted to invest in uh, conventional energy like oil and gas, or with low inflation, it meant that areas like agriculture or uh, farming, um, timber or mining um, were, were not really on investors' minds. But maybe with the pickup now in inflation, there'll be more demand for, um, for the likes of these natural resource funds um, picking up on agriculture, mining and timber. And also maybe if there's a change in energy policy for a short period of time, um, perhaps private markets, natural resource funds, uh, are able to help with that in terms of um, providing a friendlier source of, of oil and natural gas. 
Thank you. Um, for questions that's coming in, we will definitely follow up on them. But uh, thank you, Michael. Thank you.